I would be on white. Like my uh, internet sucks, or else I'd. How 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 is it possible that the chief evangelist officer is staying at a residence? In? Well, there is no officer. In my name. <laughs> <laughs> chief, though. Hello, my friends. Very cold. Thank you for joining us for the PebCAC podcast, Oakley Information Security Show featuring some all-around good people. It is week 33 of 2024. I'm Chris Louie, and as of the time of this recording, I am still COVID-free after attending Black Hat and DEF CON. Yes! I am invincible! And the two guests that we had on from last week actually tested positive, so all three of us had close contact for sure. Yeah, I, nobody I cares. Mean, yeah, nobody cares. cares. But uh, it's to be not honest, 2020. I, I think he was lying or testing with a bad test kit anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, the CDC says those expired test kits are still valid, Glenn. Mm. They also said that COVID was supposed to be something we were fearful of. So <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Now they now they say treat it like the flu. Well, actually, yeah, well, you know, giant asterisk to that. If you're in good health. No, comor- no comorbidities, you're good. Which you are, Chris. I mean, you are. <laughs> I am. The best. He's in good health, or he's he's got morbidity in him? Uh, he has no, cor- co- uh, no co... Jeez, I can't talk tonight. <laughs> the second thing, I'll leave it at that. Not, there you go. Not immunocompromise. I think I'm yes. okay. Yeah. Should be fine. If not, you guys are invited to my funeral. Everybody gets a taser. The last person standing gets my stuff. Don't worry. Uh, if you... What about those corgi legs, man? Those corgi legs. <laughs> <laughs> you talking about me again? Is that it? <laughs> no, I was making fun of Chris. I sing before you showed up. That's what Black I said. Cat. I know. Yeah. You got to yeah, listen to the last week's I will, episode. I, I will listen to last week's episode here. Now you get all the corgi plays. jokes. Yes. As you can tell, we are all back at home. The audio is amazing this week. I worked really hard to make the audio usable last week. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that episode. With me, I have my co-host, Duke Silver, who's still riding the high from that Morgan Wallen concert. How was that, Brian? You know, uh, wow. I don't know that I want to answer this question out loud. But it was, Did you yeah, really was go? Good. Yeah, I really went. Did you yeah. go? Oh, wow. Yeah. I, the only thing I'm going to say is, like, they had, like, an opening act. They had, like, one, two, yeah, three opening acts. And so in between acts, like, we had, like, about 20 minutes to to talk. And so, I, like, I did my rounds in there, but there's a couple guys that just wanted to talk through the music, and I'm just like, bro, like, I love talking tech, but I can't hear anything. So we're just standing, like, like face to face, shouting at each other the whole time. A concert's going on. I was like, oh, this sucks so bad. I was like, and that's how Brian got face. COVID for the fifth time. <laughs> no COVID over here. <laughs> but even if I did, I wouldn't know because I'm not going to test. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll talk about it when we do our Black Hat recap, but I had okay. some interesting encounters at the booth that may have perpetuated the spread of the COVID, but okay. so far I haven't gotten it, but you mean that's how our two colleagues got it. Yeah, It's a cold. <laughs> Calm down. I will say Morgan Wellen draws in a certain demographic that's very similar to a uh, Maroon 5 concert, and I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> did uh, did Br- Brian break out? Did you break out your Daisy Dukes and your Cowboy Boots? Had my shakers on and everything. No, I uh, and the chaps. Brian yeah. just he only wore chaps. Yeah. My those chaps. No, I did not see that. No, there. You know, the demographic was actually pretty wild. I mean, it's it's what you would think, but there was a lot of people there. One thing I did notice is on the plane ride back to Arizona, is someone was like on the phone. They're like, yeah, then blah blah blah, and then Jelly Roll was actually pretty good. And then everyone on the plane was apparently at the concert, and everyone was in agreement. The Jelly Roll actually performed better Jelly than Morgan Wallen. Good. Yeah, but oh, he, wow. he, it wasn't so much that he he was better. I mean, maybe he was, or I don't know. But he would he he connected with the audience a little bit better. So he he stopped and had like I don't know four or five different like little things where he just kind of shared his life. And I think made it a little bit more relatable to people. That's cool. Yeah, even on my return flight home, I saw a lot of people wearing Morgan Wellen merch, so I know that they were there for the concert. And, they were striking up conversations with other people that were at the concert. So it's, it's kind of like the Taylor Swift effect really stimulated the economy. It brought people in. 65,000 people there. It was insane. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. 
And we have Glenn Medina, or should we call him Pool Party Glenn or PPG again? How is PPG. the pool party this time, Glenn? It was great. Awesome. Uh, is it cold outside say, at all? You know, no, dude. When it's <laughs> like 90-something, you want to be in the pool. Is there a good view at the pool this year? Uh, oh, it's actually the hundreds. We're talking about Vegas, so yeah, it was a good party. <laughs> so it's a good view. Oh, so geez. I can't complain. So. We'll call him clueless, clueless pool party, Glenn. <laughs> uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I thought I thought it, I thought we were talking about the the picture that I sent to you guys about me barbecuing this past weekend, not during yeah. the week discussion. During Bro, the week, so that's the only pool we care about, Glenn. Yes, I got gotcha. you. I got. Gotcha. I don't know that chicken you made looked freaking good, man. Yeah, it was good. It was awesome. It was really good. But yeah, uh, if you've never been, you've got to go to a pool party in uh, in Vegas. So it's a good, fun time. And so. go with Glenn. Definitely go with Glenn. What was the name of the pool and what was the demographic there? <laughs> it was the kiddie pool at the MGM. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, oh, okay. where the urine content is always the, above eighty percent. Yeah, the p the the uh, yeah the the pool party shall not be named the location simply because we're gonna try and keep it a secret and keep it moving every year. So yeah, listen out next year when I give you hints about where to find me uh, for Black Hat. Like and subscribe to this podcast to find out. Yeah, yes, there you go. <laughs> No guests this week, just as hosts for a change. I think for the last minute, several weeks we've had guests on. It's been a while since it's just been us three, so it should be a, a good show. Combined, we have decades of information security experience here, not just to educate, but to entertain. We've got our usual four awesome stories for this week, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. This week, we're going to actually recap Black Hat and DEFCON. North Korea WMD funding gets disrupted. For our third topic, BEC may have finally met its match and close with rich people talk. For our first topic, since last week's episode was recorded before Black Hat had even officially started, this week we'll talk about what we observed at both conferences this year. Obviously, you two did not attend DEF CON, so I'll be handling the DEF CON portion. So uh, let's start with Black Hat talk. Oh, goody. So we talked... Yeah, there was, was a lot of people walking around, definitely. Um, I don't know. Vegas is back, baby. Vegas is back. So it was definitely busy. Dev- definitely interesting. Definitely fun. Um, but I, I didn't see anything that was like eye-catchy as far as new tech was concerned. Did you guys? The only, the only booth that really had me going, what is that? Was uh, And maybe that was the work, the job that they were supposed to do was human. You guys remember that that booth? The human booth was not memorable for me, Glenn. No. What was it? CrowdStrike Apology Tour? What was it? <laughs> no. This, describe the human booth just in case I saw it. And I don't know what the heck you're talking about. So it, it, it looked, it was basically kind of brown. It looked like there was DNA all over the booth. And they were kind of doing epidemiology type stuff where they was uh like it, it would be like definitions of insects and then the, the names that they were supposed to be or pictures of, of of things and it was kind of interesting but like i said i still didn't understood i didn't understand what it was they did so so cool booth missed its mark yeah i did not get to walk around and see anything so with the exception of abnormal, that someone told How's me. How's the abnormal booth? So I guess it's pretty interesting. I I don't know that you would buy it for just a singular thing. Well, I guess you would buy it for a singular thing. I don't know that it's like transform, like it's like a transformation type of thing. But they're email looks, security, aren't they? Yeah, email security, and it just it's kind of neat because like it just it scans the content of your email and then looks at it in context of like. Have I ever gotten an email from Glenn before? If I have, does he normally ask for, you know, uh, payment credit information? <laughs> yeah, credit card, things like that. Does he normally send up attachments? Do I normally click on like it's a it was this whole gamut of things which I thought actually which I thought was actually pretty cool. It was like natural language processing, things like that. Yeah. Just adding a, a perfect AI story there, feed it into an LLM and you apply some machine learning to it. 
Well, it makes sense, right? Like if you've never received an email from me, that's got to be suspicious. Then, or if you have, what are the what are the uh, what are the possibilities that I would be asking someone for money? I think that should be some some really good indicators right there. But I, mean, also, I guess it's like what's what's their secret sauce? Like Gmail, phenomenal spam blocker. Like what's their what's abnormal secret sauce? Like is it that well, no. natural language processing and over time behavioral learning? It, but it's the same thing with like uh so let's say that me and Glenn communicate all the time and then one day his account is hijacked, right? Stolen credentials, whatever, and then he starts asking for credit card information. That's when we would know. Or like it's or he sends over a PO, something like that. Or it would be maybe I'm always dealing with Glenn and he's always asking or sending over POs, but I recognize in the PO that the uh the routing number has changed, right? So it's actually it. pretty sweet, yeah. Hmm. That's good. So I mean it's it's like baseline it baselines the data and then it can see if there's any anomalies or outliers from that data and alert you to that potentially. Yeah. yeah. I mean we think so. I have no idea, but step step back sixty seconds though, or hundred and thirty seconds, twenty twenty seconds. Did you say that Gmail has phenomenal phishing protection? Not phishing. I didn't say phishing, I said spam. Spam. Phenomenal spam detection. Like I mean, what gets through? Is probably even if one gets through, they probably block ten thousand or a hundred thousand that never made it to your inbox. Like Gmail is known as one of the premier spam blockers. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I don't disagree. I have to go look through my things. Yeah. Did you just say you disagree with me on that? No, I don't disagree with you on it. Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, I I consistently. (laughs) Those are fighting words, Brian. (laughs) Interesting, because I consistently get a set of emails like the Norton, the Norton emails. It comes through Gmail all the time. I'm like, why is this still coming through? I don't understand that. But but here's the thing: you probably signed up for them at one point. If you hit unsubscribe, they're supposed to unsubscribe you. And if you don't, go into Gmail. If you hit report spam, you'll never hear from them again. Really? No, I know it's always. Glenn's talking about something else. It's not Norton. It's like a. It's like. (laughs) Oh, is it crazy thing? No, like it comes through and it's like, "Hey, bro, thanks to your business, blah blah." Scam. And no, it is a. It's a. uh, It's a. It's a confirmation email to Norton. Right, and it's like a screenshot of Lord knows when, right? And it's supposed to be enough just to get you to like respond back to the guy. I've seen yeah, that recently. Re- refund scam. Maybe, I, yeah, I just delete it. But yeah, I've seen those in there. I think uh, in two different Gmail inboxes as of recently. Mm. Yeah, like I said, you'll occasionally get some that slip through. Like one of the tricks the spammers used is send an invoice directly through QuickBooks because it the email comes from into it, even though it's a fake. PO. So yeah. Yeah, things like that eventually we'll, we'll get through. But the vast majority of the spray and pray type sc- spam out there, they do a really good job of, of catching it. And that's Gmail or Google. And they did things like recently they ha- you must have SPF and DKIM enabled and DMARC enabled or it automatically goes to spam. So, Glenn, this whole human security just looks like a, a WAF on steroids. Yeah, that's exactly yeah, what it is. That's, yeah, that's where they're all. Is I guess a WAF is not that. I know F five does a ton of this stuff. The the fake account defense, credential yeah, stuffing, I mean, all the stuff. Imperva probably does that to some extent too. Yeah, I got I got a maybe scraping defense, team. client side defense. Yeah, all right. No, but these guys are client side. Sponsor. <laughs> yeah, we're becoming a sponsor for human and abnormal. It was an interesting booth. Gmail. Just put it that way. <laughs> I like what they well, had. I like I, I like the design, the, the how they had it going on. But it's, yeah. it's good. We should call out vendors that catch our attention and yeah. give them positive yeah. feedback. Um, for me, lots of AI. Really, no surprise there. Same, very very similar theme as last year with the AI. You know, AI defense, AI prompt injection protection, applying AI to security tools. That, that again, the I think what probably struck me as surprising is the forgiveness for CrowdStrike. I think Brian touched upon this I think, during our podcast last week that said, there's some customers out there that says, yeah, we get it. It sucked, but you guys are still the best and we're not, we're not leaving you. I, uh, CrowdStrike had a bunch of apology billboards around. They, they paid to have pretty large billboard in the main hall that says, you know, resiliency is, is our dedication and we'll get through this together. I thought that was interesting. A lot of jokes at DEF CON about CrowdStrike, but nothing like, I, I didn't see anybody like angry at their booth. 
uh, when we'll get through I this together. There. Sounds like a, a tagline to like you know post nine eleven. Like it wasn't that <laughs> big of a deal, guys. <laughs> Dude, you know what I did here, and uh, I'm pretty sure isn't it Delta that's suing right now? Yeah, five hundred yeah, million. Couple, yeah, yeah. Apparently, they share all the lawsuits, but Delta is yeah. the one, the big one. Yeah, apparently, uh, I think CrowdStrike volunteered to send over like 32 people to help them. Yeah, send the them recovery. on site to fix it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know if they used them or they turned them away, but I was like, that's actually pretty cool. I mean, that's that's your biggest accounts reactive. I mean, if anything, I think maybe Tyson said it last week, which is, uh, if anything, it just points the giant gap in their whole, like, you guys are way oversubscribed. You need to be, you know, you're running a little too lean over there in IT. Yeah. Have diversity of operating systems. Yeah. Well, the fact that it had to go to the internet for the social justices to occur. Um, interesting, right? The fact that, you know, there's this, this litigation and all of a sudden in this evidence, there's evidence to show that actually CrowdStrike was helping. Yeah. That kind of puts a hole in their story. And, and CrowdStrike actually fired back. So there's, a, for some context here, there's a, a leaked letter. And it's Crowd, uh, Delta wrote CrowdStrike a really nasty demand letter that says, we're suing you, we're suing Microsoft. Here, you should have tested it. And you took us down for a week. And then CrowdStrike says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, we admit we screwed up. But you, number one, you turned down our free services. We're going to fly people out there to get you back online. Number two, Look at your competitors, ha ha ha! American and United were down for a day. You were down for a week. Like this seems like a pro. This seems like a Delta problem, not a CrowdStrike problem. So there's <laughs> there's going to be the inevitable back and forth on this. A little bit of an incompetence. Right. So they should while well, they're out, they should sue people for being lucky and and then falling in love for things that don't actually count. So <laughs> we'll take there things was, that don't exist. There's one booth that was right next to the Zscaler booth. And I guess this is kind of a testament to the marketing because I cannot for the life of me remember the name of the company, but I remember their tagline, which is SOAR is dead. So security orchestration, automation, remediation. Apparently that's dead. It's the company torqued. that was right, Torque. I saw that, that one as well. Brian. Yeah. So you remembered it. You were at the booth for maybe 10 minutes and you remembered it. And I was at the booth for two straight days and I couldn't remember it off the top it of my head. It was one of the few that I actually got to walk by that day. So. Yeah, cool marketing. The whole sore is dead. They had this whole skeleton, dead person theme to it. It was interesting. Uh, there's an automation company that Victor pointed me to. Again, I can't remember it, which is not good. But that that seemed pretty. It was like drag and drop automation, so you can orchestrate your security and just drag and drop widgets. That was that Tim's? CrowdStrike C2. It might have been. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, so that you could drag and drop these modules. It says, if CrowdStrike C2 beacon, then contain, then set off an alert to the SOC, then you know, leave the user a voicemail or, or text the user to shut off their laptop, something like that. So it's, oh, that was pretty it's cool, user-friendly enterprise, automation. Enterprise, if that, then this. Pretty much, <laughs> Don't yeah. get me wrong. But it did look pretty sweet, though. I'll give them that. Yeah. So that, that's mainly what, what stuck out at me. Uh, Threat Locker and Armist, they were super triple diamond platinum sponsored. They had gigantic booths right in front. Still don't know what they do, but they had some pretty cool. Bro, booths. I was going to say that same thing. I was like, man, they got a big ass booth. I don't even know what they do, but they got money to spend. <laughs> I think Armist. Threat Locker is like, Threat yeah. Locker is allow listing software on steroids because it basically said like, don't allow anything to run unless we approve it. And that sounds a lot like allow listing software. I thought Armist just had like old money. Like maybe they did like storage backups. And they're just like pissing it away now. We do security. <laughs> I have no idea. I, th I thought Armist was like a competitor to Titanium, right? Where they do device control or device management. No? It might be. I have no clue what they do. <laughs> <laughs> they had a big booth, they a, though. Yeah, they had a really big booth. It was cool. That was Victor's favorite booth of the show. I mean, Victor or Kobe, I forget who I was walking with. Like that why? was a favorite booth. And did they say it why? just looked cool? No, I mean, that oh. was. It looked like a club, like real neutral purple yeah. color. Bro. Guys, who were the people? Who were the no. people? Was it Sentinel One that had the people that were dressed up like, like ninjas, walk digital ninjas walking around with shields? Was that Sentinel One? It was purple was, and black. There's a company called Adaptive Shield. They had a guy in like knight armor with the giant shield. Yeah, 
Hmm. So the, the did you guys line... did you guys encounter Jack Sparrow? No. At all? no, no. You guys didn't see him. He was walking around and he's like, he he, he played the part well. And he's like, did you know about security? And then he was trying to play the part. And I'm like, uh, you want my badge scan to take a picture with you? I'm I'm cool. Yeah. So real quick, Armis, its tagline is protect your extended asset attack surface. When I click on it, their headline is Armis surpasses 200 million ARR. Oh, I'm so- okay, so they're not early stage, but they're not late stage either. So they're still a growth company then, 200 million AR. Bro, what Wiz. are you talking about? They had the biggest booth ever, and they only, they're making pennies. Like, this is nothing. 200 million ARR, and they're like, uh, they should have yeah, a, that was... a, an Ikea desk, not the biggest Maybe booth on the man. Maybe they're looking to get bought. That was Cyber Reason. So Cyber Reason two years ago had the biggest booth in the front, and then no one, no one heard from them again. Like they blew their entire marketing budget on this one event, put all their eggs in one basket. I feel like they they yoloed on the whole Vegas thing. Like they're just like, let's just do it, see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Why not? not a good sign. Not a good sign to do. I don't know. Right, so the two hundred million AR, they're probably not public yet. I'm guessing they're probably no. Series D, maybe. I'll have to look this up later. Zoom AI, take a note. See what funding round Armis is on. Damn. Yeah, right, anyway. the, that was the highlights for me. Black Hat was cool. There, There's an, a whole AI village now, which I don't believe they had it last year. If they had it last year, it definitely was not as big as this year. So there's a lot more talks and research related to AI security. It was in a different spot this year. It was in the Las Vegas Convention Center last two years it was at caesar's forum and i gotta say the space is much much bigger at the convention center the hallways were actually walkable it didn't feel super crowded i liked the venue the beef i had with it and what angered a lot of people was that the hotel right next door that you could book through a defcon block to get the room rate uh results world hilton i have no problem calling these idiots out they they put these letters in the room that said uh, we reserve the right to come in. Uh, not actually, they didn't actually say we reserve the right. They said we will come in at least once a day to inspect your room, even if you have the privacy sign on the do not disturb on. We are coming in. We are inspecting your room. Uh, to uh, of course, they spent for the safety of our guests here. Uh, apparently, they were afraid of somebody setting up a pineapple or hacking the hotel from the inside. And uh, I, I saw the news article today. What they were actually looking for, so get this. So they're looking for flipper zeros. They were looking <laughs> which, for pineapples. which is not in plain sight, <laughs> right? Yeah. So they're looking for Wi-Fi pineapples. When when Victor had his room invaded, he was in the shower, and they were like banging on his door until he opened up. So he came out in a towel, opens up the door, and the guy's like, "I gotta check your room." So then he comes in. He looked at all the power outlets in the room. So I guess if you have a pineapple, they think it's plugged in. They're gonna just check. But that. he's in the <laughs> shower. <laughs> yeah, right? and they're gonna bang on your door. What the hell? Oh, yeah, that, you would that think that sounds like a lawsuit no one, happening. Yeah, if no one answers, like you move on to the next one. No, they were like pounding on his door until he opened up, even though he was in the shower. And then the other kind of odd thing was they were looking for soldering irons. Like, it, are you afraid someone's gonna make a bomb or something? Like, one of our colleagues brought. I mean, he went to a suite where they had soldering irons. They were like making badges, like the actual DEF CON badges. They were making like fun things. Like you go to a convention like this, you want to build your own circuits and things. You're going to bring a soldering iron. Like why? Of all things to look for, a soldering iron is one of their watch list items. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. So that that's my rant on, on that. It, it's well documented on the internet. They're getting a lot of hate for this. People are saying... You know, I'm never going to stay with this again. I'm never using a DEF CON room blocking. And because the internal memo that the hotel sent out said, we will inspect. Well, first of all, they said they were targeting single males checked into a room by themselves. Like, <laughs> kind of profiling. And then they said all the rooms booked through the DEF CON block are the ones that are going to be subject to. And then even, I guess those are the priority rooms that security had to hit. And then all the other rooms that were not booked the defcon block like housekeeping would just barge in on them or something so i don't know it, it, the whole thing was dumb um they don't realize that a rooted android phone could do more damage than any of the stuff that they were looking for it's 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 ridiculous well were there any incidences 
Because Not of that. that I heard of. I, 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 as of InfoSec Twitter and the DEF CON subreddit, no one said that they got hassled for anything they had, but it was just the policy and the invasion of privacy that really upset people. Yeah. Yeah, if I would have, I, I would have walked out butt naked and says, "Hey, what's going on? What are you guys? What are you guys here for? You want a tip? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't order hookers and blow. So what the heck's going on? <laughs> Make it super awkward, super awkward, Glenn. Like yeah, it. yeah. Uh, I, uh, exactly. I will say, I am never staying at Mandalay Bay again. I'm done. I can't do it. Like those. Why is that? Room, what's going on? Like, like it's if like convenience factor, great. The room though. You didn't have a suite. 70, uh, 70, yeah, right. <laughs> 70, well, dude, even in the penthouse, it was still 75 degrees. I was up there yeah. sweating my taint off. There was this, there's an issue. There was an issue this past week with the AC. I don't know if anyone noticed that, but it was warm. I was like, the same No matter year, how cold I said before. it. Oh, was it? Really? Yeah. 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 So I'm yeah, either, I went, I'm going back to the link, boys. That place was 50 degrees. Even so you're knowing. Saying, <laughs> Did Knowing that Brian there? was 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 gonna be in my room recording the podcast, I set my thermostat to like sixty five or however low it would go. And Brian came in, it's like, hmm, no, this is acceptable. It wasn't. It definitely wasn't sixty five, but it was acceptable yeah. to Brian's standards. Did, did 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 Brian sneak that in there? He says, even in the penthouse suite at the Mandalay Bay, it was <laughs> he still... did he did a little humble brag in there. Yeah, I know yeah. what the heck, Brian? What's going on? So from the presidential there. suite, looking yeah. down on you peasants, yeah. it was still yeah. too hot for me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as a so the room was cool and all, but it wasn't that cool, right? Like it's this, it's this big, um, and I wasn't staying there. But you know what's crazy about that is I could have thrown a party there like so easily because we had no one in there at night, but we had the room blocked out until you know Friday morning. So as long as you cleaned up, no one would be the wiser. That's yeah. right. No black lights. <laughs> And since Glenn said blacklight, for our second topic related to the story we did two weeks ago about the cybersecurity company No Before unknowingly hiring a North Korean spy, the U.S. Department of Justice has just dismantled a remote laptop farm in Nashville, Tennessee. Authorities arrested a man named Matthew Newt, who allegedly provided housing for a company provided laptops and also helped launder payments for the remote IT work to North Korean and Chinese accounts. The victim company shipped their laptop address to Newt's residences, and following the receipt of those laptops, Newt logged in on those laptops, downloaded and installed unauthorized remote desktop applications, and accessed the victim's computer's networks. This is again why it's just so important to block those desktop sharing surfaces like go to my PC or any desk or team view or any of those that would allow someone to remotely control that computer from North Korea. I don't know. Authorities arrested a man named Matthew Newt, who allegedly provided housing for company provided laptops that were what stolen or that were fake hired, like uh, the yeah, what North Korean spy. Wrong? Yeah, what, so what it was, was like it, it was sort of like the the fake hire. So the, our story we did two weeks ago. No, before hired this North Korean spy. No, before shipped the laptop to call if it was this guy. We don't know if it was this guy, but let's say. The, no before shipped the laptop to this guy in Nashville because the North Korean spy says, I'm Matthew Newt. I live at this address in Nashville. Send my laptop here. So no before sends the laptop there. This guy sets it up in his living room and then sets up any desk so that the guy in North Korea can then remote into that laptop and look like he's working out of Nashville. Mm. You think they would have known before? But a bump Yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Dad joke of the week. But even like yeah. so, number one, he shouldn't be in trouble for this. This is dumb. It's, if anything, it's on the companies that didn't stop them from install, installing the software, blocking. If you don't want them to use it, then don't do it. Yeah. So what's interesting about this story is I read through the entire list of of charges against him. This guy collected the paychecks that were supposed to go to the North because you obviously can't do direct deposit to a North Korean bank. So you have to have an address. A U.S. bank account. So this guy would collect the paychecks, take his cut, launder the money, and then send it to North Korea. But he paid his payroll taxes on all that money that he collected. So he filed taxes for him and everything. So nowhere in his charges is tax evasion or tax fraud. He paid his taxes. What they're getting him on is money laundering and wire fraud, which is you know, pretty bad, but 
They How about treason? How about treason? Yeah. <laughs> How does that sound? Yeah. Providing uh, material support to a terrorist organization, good. yeah. Or even another <laughs> state-sponsored country, right? So, I mean, that's what we're talking yeah. about here. Yeah, so that's what Money Laundry is a stretch, guys. I think he's going to get out. He just needs to uh, better call Saul. He'll be fine. I, I think he needs to go to Guantanamo Bay, and then they they do all kinds of stuff to him over there. Some fun stuff. Bro, yeah, I was working so. at um, Bank of the America, Bank of America at the time, and we were doing some push one night uh, updates. And I remember I I shared my screen with this one website that I found with one of my coworkers because we were like troubleshooting something. He's he's like my direct report. And, you know, it worked. We did our thing, whatever. And then, like, a month goes by, and he's like, he's like, we got a security incident that you're using the software. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, look it up. I'm like, yeah, remember? We were literally on a call that night, and I was sharing my screen because nothing else was working with you. He's like, I don't recall this. I'm like, okay, corporate red tape <laughs> everywhere. So I just had to, like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, he totally threw me in the bus. I was like, all right, we, we don't use this anymore. Whatever. Hmm. Was it join.me? That was one. We I used to use a lot to remote support people. It might have been. Join dot me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Taking taking Glenn back. Yeah. But yeah, this guy I think I think they said if he hits the maximum it's like twenty years in prison or something. So I hope they throw the book at this guy. I mean he was materially funding a state sponsor of terror. Well, I don't know. I know. Is North Korea state sponsored? I know they're on the sanctions list, so there's some treasury charges in there yeah but treason north korea, that's what I would, I would call it like they're funding north korean wmd research yeah it was funny so the headlines like bleeping computer just says u.s dismantles laptop farm used by undercover north korean hackers uh, the record tennessee man charged over north korea and worker scheme and this is what dark reading says tennessee man helped dprk workers get jobs to, at U.S. organizations to fund WMDs, like they just had to throw that in the the, the headline oh. that this is funding weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> Again, stuff why to write about. Yeah. is a company that's capable of creating weapons of mass destruction have such weak security that this could even be pulled off? I don't get it. Um, and now they're they're implying that since he sent money to North Korea, North Korea is using it to fund their WMD research because they're under heavy sanction. You know what all I'm hearing is they're anti-capitalist. That's all. <laughs> Sanctions bad. <laughs> These guys are funny. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. For our third topic, International Law Enforcement Agency Interpol has successfully reversed $40 million in stolen funds during a business email compromise or BEC scam. So talking about abnormal security machine learning and stopping these kinds of scams it's about wait, time wait. interpol's a real we thing we had a win yeah interpol is a real thing and it's it stands for something it says like international police agency or something like that oh i thought yeah. that was just like a that tom cruise movie thing the mission impossible wow. that's imf <laughs> the impossible mission force which does not pu- exist <laughs> publicly does not exist no no the, the, the don't they talk with interpol though like in they the do yeah. yeah a lot of movies like yeah. red notice yeah. Was another one. Who was it? The uh, Hobbs and Shaw, right? It was yeah, Interpol. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the hitman, the good one with Timothy Oliphant. They have yes. agents from Interpol. Yeah, yeah. That guy well, this marks the largest. <laughs> this marks the largest recovery of funds in a BEC scam ever. On July fifteenth, a firm had received an email from a supplier requesting that a pending payment be sent to a new bank account based in the. Timor Lesti. The email, however, came from a fraudulent account spelled slightly different from the supplier's official email address. So really nothing new there, off by one domains and everything. That's tale as old as time. Thinking this was a legitimate request, the firm wired $42.3 million to the attack-controlled bank accounts, only to realize four days later that they had fallen for an attack. They did not realize the mistake until the supplier actually called them asking why the payment had not yet been sent. So if it sounds familiar, it's because it is. This is a very common BEC type scam. Interpol's Global Rapid Intervention of Payments or iGRIP system can be used to request assistance from authorities in Timor Leste to recover, and they were able to recover $39 million from the BEC attacked. 
and further investigations yielded the arrest of seven suspects and recovered another $2 million. So the total recovered amount was $41 million, meaning that company only lost only lost $1.3 million. It still sucks, but it's better than losing $42 million. Yeah. Where did the $1.3 million go? Did it just get siphoned off in fees, bank fees? As they were trying Could to be, yeah, the commission, <laughs> the, the, the Ford exchange fee. That's funny. <laughs> so the banks probably were charging it to begin with anyway. So, yeah. It probably, maybe some of it went to money meals and they were able to cash out or it was out of the reach of Interpol at that point. They wired it to banks in Syria or Russia or Iran and they just can't touch it. I feel like a payment that large should be not just one person signing off on it. It, it might have been. It might have looked legitimate and like, yeah, this invoice looks real. This is a supplier we deal with. Go ahead. Send the money. Man, it's, I crap my pants and I make that... a credit card payment. Not <laughs> 40 plus million? No way, man. Yeah. Actually, that's, that's the thing. small town thinking. I need to up my game. I need to start I need to start making monthly payments of $39 million. Get out of the hawk. I'm going to start thinking bigger, boys. Just, I would... just say there's no malware in this. There's no malware detection system that would have caught this. It's it's email filters that could scan for things like say this is off by one or someone from this domain has never emailed you before. That's the but the I, real I think security you, of it. I, I think about it this way, right? This is a payment system. You're going to a bank. It's based off of a domain. I, I can't imagine there's some check that you couldn't do to validate that the entry was correct, right? Domain name entry. Matched across the list of what uh, what your current allowed list are as far as domains and account numbers and routing numbers. You would think. I guess the the other piece of it is the human factor, so the social engineering factor. That any time somebody requests different bank details, always call them and double verify. Call them on a known yeah. good number and verify yeah. that this is legitimate yeah. before just say, yeah, this is like if, like when I bought my house, if some, I got the wiring instructions directly from the escrow company. And if someone from the escrow company says, oh, wait, wait, it's not this gun, it's that one, then I would have called them. And I actually did call them. I called them three different times during three different times of the day to verify that this is the correct wiring yeah. information. Yeah. They probably have, oh, God, has it's Chris again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I told you the OPSEC I did when I had to make that wire payment for my new house. Like I power washed a Chromebook. I installed Zscaler on it. And that was, those are the only two things. I had Chrome and had Zscaler. And that was it. So I passed by the abnormal office today in Redwood City. It looked like a nightclub that like all the windows are washed out or blacked out. But I could have swore it was the abnormal logo that was on top of it. Could be. They might be based out of here. Oh, I guarantee it. He always is. Better is right now. And that poses a few questions. Like if these thieves were in Timor Leste, like how on earth do you launder forty three million dollars? Like if it's it, if it's a little bit, you can send it to money meals and you can cash out, but how do you launder that much money? Like how's that possible? Without raising any red flags. I guess send it to a sanctions free country. Or, I mean, a country that's not part of the SWIFT system or this iGRIP system. Well, I'm not going to tell you because then I'll get caught. Yeah. <laughs> Brian knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you do is you buy USD Tether and then you send it to this account and then cash it out for, for shroot bucks and then you take these shroot bucks. And, <laughs> and you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. You guys are funny. And it's sort of like the role of cryptocurrency that the, they have this iGRIP system that ties into the banking system. So that means that means Interpol can intercept your money. But what if you're you know wiring money? You're a political dissident and you're trying to wire money. Can, and Interpol doesn't like you for some reason. Can they stop it? That's the whole reason we have cryptocurrency is that there's no person in the middle, no authority that can regulate it or stop it or reverse it. But that's also a risk if this company had sent $43 million of Bitcoin, like, sorry, bro, that money's gone. Unless it hits a friendly exchange, you'll never see that again. I feel like you say that all the time, but it always ends up hitting an exchange of some nature. I think it's frozen. Track them down. <laughs> yeah. Or the FBI somehow hacks the private key of the, the, the wallet holding the money, like in, uh, what was that, Colonial, Colonial Pipeline. 
You don't think they already have it though? Maybe they, they maybe they're just holding their cards to their chest, and they don't want you to know that they can recover these things. Yeah. I just gotta think that it's all there, like all the stuff that we think is safe and secure. It's already been. In. Did you guys it's see a- that bit? Of, I'm gonna have to plug our own company here, but Zscaler, we did some research with ransomware groups and blockchain analysis, and we figured out that a Fortune 50 company paid a $75 million ransom in Bitcoin to this Dark Angel ransomware gang. And we're not saying who it is, but we know they're Fortune 50. And I've heard from back channels that it's a pharmaceutical related company. So I'm like, I think we could probably narrow it down and, f- and figure out who it was. Let me use ChatGPT real quick, I'll tell you. $75 million. That's a lot of that's a lot of scratch, as Brian likes to say. And they kept their name out of the news, so maybe it was worth it for them. Their systems weren't disrupted. They kept their name out of the news. There was no 8K that they filed that I know of. It's still a mystery who this company is, but they might be on the hook for some SEC violations if that were actually the case. It wasn't Caesars. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they paid what was it fifteen? Was it three million or fifteen million? They negotiated it down, right? Yeah. It just started at twenty it was, something. It was three or fifteen. It might have been fifteen, I think. Yeah, I'm not saying the name uh, of it. <laughs> Brian figured it out. <laughs> yeah, good for them. There's enough breadcrumbs, people can figure it out. We're not we're not telling who it was. I I, I mean personally I don't even know. Like I don't, I don't even want to know is, anymore. I'm sure we could figure it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 75 million though that's it's a lot that's of a good for what, them. what shirt is that chris what do, what, what do you got on there no, it's just uh a, a shirt that sends a message that no matter how far down you think you are down the rabbit hole you should always stand up and continue to fight and persevere it's a very encouraging message i believe does it oh, have a, a flag there. on the right on the right arm uh, actually, there? it does not. <laughs> oh, you didn't buy the no. one I told you to buy? You loser. No, I didn't buy the one you told me to buy. I found my own, but there's no patch. You know what that is? That's a Chinese knockoff. Yeah. You're sending Probably. a weird message because it looks like Obama and Trump are standing next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> they have been seen together. Yes. Yeah. All right. For our last topic, it'll be a rotating topic every week. This week, we're going to talk about what is a surefire way to tell if someone is rich? Now, it's no secret. We know people and work with people that had large IPO paydays or just or are just very good at investing. What do you guys notice about rich people? They drive yes. a Honda Accord. <laughs> yes, very modest. That is true. So, some of them are very, I think you hit like this bell curve. Where if it's upper middle class, I think then that's when they start buying luxury cars. And then I would say upper class, they might buy, you know, Bentley or something like that. But then when you get into the ultra, ultra rich, that's when you find out they have like the Honda Accords, the Toyota Camrys and or the Mazdas. I think all those people with those really nice supercars and everything, I think they're all faking it. They're all living a life, but I don't think they really own those things. They're all they're all rented like those rappers. Yeah. 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 Jay's the only I person know. I know that's rich. So, and he's pretty humble. Yeah, he is. Founder CEO. Yeah. Symbol. I would say we we know some other maybe not like billionaires, but we know some wealthy people. They all have planes, boats. Yeah, that, <laughs> I think that's yeah. the other thing that yeah, you hit Yacht. you hit the the bell curve on that and yeah. at at some like maybe a private like a modest private jet, I would say, like not a Cessna G6 or whatever, but a you know, modest private jet. And sometimes it just makes sense. Like your time is, your time literally is money and it's valuable. And you don't want to spend three hours waiting at a, in an airport lounge when you can just fly private there. So, I mean, I could see that. Like Warren Buffett, second, maybe third richest man on the planet. He has a private jet, but you know, he's, he's earned it. So, all right. You obviously don't know Warren Buffett. So put it in the chat of like who you think is rich. I don't know of anybody in in our with our within our group of friends. Yeah, within he's, he's talking about people like, that we know, right? Oh, maybe. Does, well, does I mean, we kind of like execs from the. Yeah, 
Mm. Those two came to mind. I, I put it in our signal chat. Yeah. And I, so I will say of of the people that we are in their their circle. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, Glenn. <laughs> oh gosh. So here's the thing. So, I'll be honest with you. All three of those people didn't have enough pre-IPO stock to really be rich. Uh, yeah. Maybe no, yeah. Even the first I think guy. So. When I look at middle, lo, I would say lower and middle class people, and they, you, you ask, what's your portrait of a rich person? Like they would probably tell you, oh, they wear Gucci suits, they wear a Rolex watch, they wear lots of gold, they wear all these, you know, Fendi, like all these nice labels. Like that's what lower middle class aspire to be, and that's one of their signals of being rich. And then once you get to rich people, sure, there's people like that on on tv and people on social media that are like that but when you get to the ultra what i would consider like ultra wealthy like ultra high net worth individuals no labels so they have no labels but their clothes fit perfectly like like i showed i told you at one sk i took a picture i was in my suit and then someone spotted was like oh your your sleeve's too long or you're this this is like they noticed those those things but when you see like an ultra wealthy person like everything down to the millimeter is like perfect and no labels. Yeah, that's true. I remember seeing Chris. He had a Rolex on, custom fitted <laughs> suit, and a Model X. Rich, yeah, that's rich guys. Rich, totally rich. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not like he yeah. owns like an Airbnb or anything. So, I remember when I was a kid, it was like it was basic stuff, like a color TV. That's when you were rich. You knew you made it. Yeah. Stairs yeah, in your house. Oh. Orange you juice defi- in the fridge. You got to define rich a little bit too. Like, are we talking like don't have to work rich? Are we talking about like? I think you 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 kind of labeled a little bit right, like upper middle class versus just stupid, right? Sure. I would I would say rich being considered. You don't have to work if you don't want to. Oh yeah. Like you're financially secure. Like I don't know if you could retire just because of the way healthcare works here in the U.S., but like. You don't have to work if you don't want to. Well, definitely not in California. The California's just ridiculous, though. So. Yeah, that's yeah. one of those things. Yeah. Like, if you lose your job, you're not gonna be sweating over it. Like, you don't have to worry about how you're gonna make rent next month. That you you've got your very large cushion saved up. I think you're right, though. If you have a plane, you definitely do. If you have your own chef, then you're you're a rich person. That's for sure. I'm trying to think, but yeah. Else. I think people that never talk about money, and this is this is a. a story related to actual people that i know and some of them are just always talking about money everything has to be money how much do you make did you you know how much did... so something happened in my family uh recently where somebody passed away and then when i i told a, a person in my circle about that like their first question was like oh how much was your inheritance how much did you get for that like why why is that your first thing that you go to to see how much money i got out of this person dying instead of saying you know, how did they die? Are you okay? Or yeah. that was the first thing that they jumped to. Like people that all, always worry about or always talk about money, you know, they're not rich because when they're always thinking about it, that means they're, they're, they're always worried about Still it. Still on the hunt. That's why I'm broke. Cause I always talk about money. So, <laughs> <laughs> so no are you saying that no people love. that, are you talking about that people that never talk about money are rich? Generally wealthy. Generally yes. wealthy. Okay. Yeah. It's like, when you look at the menu and they're like, like that looks good. I'll take that. And not having to do the math in your head about, oh, can I afford this or should I get the cheaper options? Like, no, I want the filet mignon. I'm going to get the filet mignon today and not worry about the price. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I actually did that the other day. Me and my wife went out to like a, a dinner date and we both ordered food. And I was like, I didn't even look at the price when I just ordered. I'm like, he, That's just, he just handed... He handed yeah. the waiter the menu and says, yes, thank you. Yes. He just ordered everything on the menu. <laughs> I don't know if you heard like, me correctly, what, but I said, give me all the meats. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, did I stutter? Yeah. <laughs> oh, but I had, it was prime rib. Oh, my God. It was so good. I got an end cut. It was, whew. Ooh. I haven't had that in a while. Why do you yeah. like the end cut? I, I'm not a big fan of the end cut. Then I might as well just have all the seasoning on it. All right. It's mm. So, it, all right. I am a little. All right. So I did. I did go uh, big back on this. So I got an end cut and a, I got two pieces. So the end cut and regular, and then I just cut them and then ate them together. For Chris's point exactly, which is the seasoning. Yeah. See, and I'm a, a I'm a middle cut. 
middle cut rare. I just yeah. can't get over it. And then I love eating the crust on the outside because it goes yeah. so well with the blood on the inside. So oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and then that man, fat cap, hurt. the f- steak the f- talk. And then the fat cap with that little rubber little fat that's a oh man that jelly's so good mm. uh-huh. i think mm-hmm. i'm gonna have to go Girl. someplace i'm gonna have to go someplace this week i'm gonna mm-hmm. have to go find some prime rib mm-hmm. go to house of prime let's rib go. Glenn. preach yeah let's go preach glenn let's for go. yes <laughs> and the last thing i will say is uh, people that are not overly braggadocious so the people that really brag about what they have their possessions their wealth and they have to always flash it i think those people are very insecure and want people to think that they're rich but i think the actual ultra wealthy people they don't talk about it because they don't want people coming around either robbing them or asking them for handouts or just knowing that they're rich so what if you're overly braggadocious about how many bills you have was that is that a good sign that you're <laughs> let me rich see how much debt i got rich? guys <laughs> hey, let me show you this <laughs> yeah so rich people don't worry about money so it's have just you ever seen a bill. six-figure student loan <laughs> <laughs> I have. <laughs> Jeez, I have. Uh, rip. <laughs> Grad Sorry, school. Glenn. Yeah. Yes, I have. It's ugly. All right. Well, we continue to get great comments about our dad joke of the week. Dad joke of the week. This week, Glenn is up. And in true DEF CON nature, don't F this up like Victor did last week. Oh, Victor was just. That was really bad. <laughs> it it, it was somewhere. bad because. <laughs> because we actually had it before. So We've had like, that joke on like five, yeah. like, I don't know if it was literally five times, but it's been on more than once for sure. Yeah. How about this one? How did the Vikings communicate with each with each other? How's that? Morse By code. Norse code. <laughs> Norse code or Morse Norse, code? Norse, Norse code. code. <laughs> w. Good one. Right, that's a good one. Yeah, way better than Victor's last. There last you week. go. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Victor was under the weather. That's why. <laughs> all right. To wrap things up, Black Hand and DEF CON were all about AI. It just got harder for North Korean workers to get U.S. work. Interpol's iGrip system works, and rich people don't think about money. That's all I have for this week. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. You can find us on LinkedIn. Links will be in the description. Follow us on Instagram at Pepcac Podcast. Thank you to our listeners and subscribers who raised five stars to the iTunes store and Spotify and left us a review. We appreciate you all spreading the word to help grow the show. The best way to find us is to search for the Pepcac Podcast in your favorite podcast listening app. For our host Brian Deach and Glenn Medina, I'm Chris Louie. Thanks for listening. We'll see you all next weekend. As always, have a nice day. Bye, Felicia. Toodles.